And so we learned that soon there were other loopholes that remained open. Beyond the reach of federal oversight, the derivatives market swelled to the size of $600 trillion. There were no rules to prevent systemic failure, fraud, or manipulation. No one ensured that these products served any commercial function beyond gambling. And no one worked to make sure traders understood the products they traded. And it turns out traders often use the stockholder value of major financial institutions to gamble in markets they did not understand, with bets large enough to put the entire financial system at risk. They bet on oil. They bet on natural gas. And with the creation of the credit default swap, they began to bet on each other's demise. New exotic financial products were dreamed up, like the recent one to trade movie box office futures, which was proposed by Cantor Exchange just this year. What public benefit is served by trading box office futures? All it does is create a huge problem for the motion picture industry. In 2000, AIG and Lehman collapsed under the weight of unregulated financial derivatives. But this time, it was not only Western energy consumers that suffered. The unregulated derivatives market brought our entire economy to its knees. And that's why it's so vital that we learn from this experience and implement the derivatives reform proposals that have been put forward by Senators Lincoln and Dodd. Let me take a few moments to describe some of the bill's key positions. It will require every trade to be reported in real time to the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. So regulators will know that will know for the first time what is actually going on in these markets. They will be transparent. They won't be dark markets. Everyone will know. It will require standardized, high-volume trades to be cleared through a regulated clearinghouse. This will ensure that everyone in the system gets paid even when one trader defaults. Had we had this system in place, AIG's collapse would not have posed a systemic risk. Swaps dealers who sell uncleared contracts to end users, which are more risky than cleared trades, will be subject to significantly higher capital requirements, enforced by the CFTC in cooperation with bank regulators. The bill helps small commercial end users, such as utilities or trucking companies, hedge their risks, but major financial institutions and mutual funds will have to conduct their trading in regulated markets. That is a good thing. It will require that all cleared contracts to be traded on an exchange or on a swap execution facility. Trading on exchanges or execution facilities provide for pre-trade transparency, again, light, which is necessary to fully understand and manage the risks being taken by market participants, to provide more efficient and accurate pricing, and to facilitate more cost-effective risk management. It will require speculative position limits to be set in the aggregate for each commodity instead of contract by contract. Position limits provide an important restriction on market manipulation and the amount of risk that can build up in any one market participant. For the first time, the CFTC will be able to prevent speculators from assembling massive positions in a particular commodity such as oil, by assembling large positions in multiple contracts. See how they do that. Traders 
can now simply buy positions on Brent crude oil when they have exceeded limits in West Texas intermediate crude oil. And that makes no sense. See, it's a way to be hidden in the size of your trade. Aggregate position limits will prevent manipulative practices, such as those deployed by the defunct hedge fund Amaranth in 2007, which assembled massive positions on two separate natural gas contracts and manipulated one in order to profit on the other. And let there be no doubt about this, Amaranth uh, settled, paid a huge fine in substantial millions of dollars. Further, the fund will close the London loophole, so they can't just go around American law by requiring that foreign boards of trade adhere to minimum standards comparable to those in the United States and reporting all trading activities to United States regulators on a timely basis. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the bill will prevent FDIC-insured retail banks and banks with access to the Federal Reserve discount window from engaging in the extremely risky practice of swaps dealing with a government guarantee. That is really important. This innovative and important provision effectively implements the Volcker Rule and protects taxpayers. So you can see what a big bill is. Remember, it was derivatives that brought the House of Cards down. Now there's transparency, there's clearing, there's position limits. And I very much thank the chairman of the committee for negotiating with Senator Lincoln and achieving this. It is a monumental gain. I very strongly believe that all swaps activities in commercial banking should be distinct so that taxpayers do not supplement or subsidize or guarantee or ensure the riskiest activities of large financial institutions. Now, there's no denying that opponents of the bill are trying to come up with new and creative ways to block this bill. With so much at stake, it's not surprising that allies of big banks and Wall Street lenders have already launched a million dollar ad campaign to frame the debate and fight these changes. They are cynically twisting the facts to assert that this legislation will perpetuate more bailouts in the future. Nothing could be further from the truth. The big Wall Street firms that caused this crisis have hired lobbyists to portray Wall Street reform as something that is bad for taxpayers. The loudest detractors of financial regulatory reform claim that it will be just another government intrusion in the free market. Well, we have found out that the free market is not self-regulating. Recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that opponents of regulatory reform have adopted talking points distributing by, distributed by a messaging firm whose clients include Bank of America, Chase Card Services, and UBS. The memo suggests that the best way to kill the bill is to link it to the big bank bailout. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have adopted these talking points and are doing everything they can to block this bill. This is both dangerous and absurd. If we have learned anything from the recent past, it's that the disorderly failure of massive financial institutions is extremely destructive. And so for the first time, with the passage of this bill, we will have a process in place to ensure the most minimal disruption necessary in order to wind down failures on Wall Street. That's what this is about. And the $50 billion is not government money. The $50 billion is a fund that the companies contribute to, which is held in escrow by the government so that if it has to be used, 
it can be used. So I stand behind Chairman Dodd when he emphasizes the level of bipartisan negotiation that has gone into the bill before it.